happening is while this area is depolarizing, this area is going to start very soon. Okay, this is what we call propagation. Okay, the active potential is propagated down the axon. Okay, think of propagated as it's transferred down the axon. Okay, um, so. So now, oh, this is what I want to talk about. So I want to talk a little bit about something called the refractory period. Let me just get all this stuff off of here. Okay, the refractory period. Okay, so what's going to happen as this cell is depolarized, okay, you know, while sodium gates are open and there's an influx of sodium, this upward spike on the graph, okay, that's what we're going to call the absolute refractory period. Okay, this is a period of time where you will not generate a new action potential. Okay, the environment of the cell has changed so significantly that, I mean, you're already in the middle of generating an, an, an action potential, an impulse, okay? So during the absolute refractory period, that would basically be in this big up spike, okay, there will be no new action potential initiated. So on this, so basically in this segment, okay, while the sodium gates are open, no new action potential, okay. But then when the sodium gates close, okay, and the potassium gates open, and potassium starts to leak out, all right, you're going to start going back down towards this resting membrane potential. Okay, even though you're not fully recovered, okay, you still, you know, you still got back, you know, you know, back below this threshold. Okay, you can irritate this nerve, you know, if, you know, if it's a strong enough stimulus to generate another action potential before it's fully recovered. Okay, so the period while the potassium gates are, you know, while there's this, while there's this potassium efflux is what we call the uh, the relative. Refractory period. Okay, but like I said, it, it's going to take a very strong stimulus to generate another action potential during this recovery stage. Okay, so again, absolute refractory period occurs when there's the sodium influx, and the relative refractory period is going to occur during the potassium efflux. Okay, now in talking about all of this, okay, in, in discussing all of this, this should help you to appreciate. Um, as you as you move further in your studies, electrolyte imbalances. Okay, when you see sodium and potassium imbalances. Okay, because I mean, what systems, what tissues do you think are going to be going to be the most greatly affected by this? The excitable tissues, the irritable tissues. Okay, and you know because I mean this, you know, the activity of these cells revolves around the movement of sodium and potassium. Okay, so if you have too much of or too less of, uh, you know, these electrolytes, there's going to be problems, okay? And the question you should be asking yourself then, which is the most dangerous to have an imbalance of? Okay, is it going to be sodium or potassium? Okay, and the answer to that is going to be potassium. Okay, the reason why is because, remember, potassium is the ion that, 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 that allows us to establish this resting membrane potential, okay? So if we're unable to establish this resting membrane potential, okay, if we're too hyperpolarized or we are, you know, or we don't fully repolarize, okay, then that's going to be a problem. Okay, that's going to be a problem. All right, because if we're, you know, if the inside of the cell becomes too negative, then this, it's going to be harder to initiate an action potential. Okay, if it doesn't recover enough, you, that cell just may shut down. Okay, because it's going to be you know, it's going to be, think of it as like being in constant fiery mode, okay? That's kind of a weird way to put it, but you guys get the gist. Okay, so electrolyte imbalances, you're going to see problems in nervous tissue and muscle tissue because these are irritable, excitable tissues, okay? So remember, so remember these concepts of the action potential and propagation, okay? If we do something to irritate this nerve to open sodium gates, and then once we get enough sodium into the cell, and get that membrane potential beyond its threshold, 
then what's going to happen is you're going to um, you're going to you're going to open a lot more sodium gates, and then you do, that's the depolarization aspect of an action potential. Okay, and also what we call the absolute refractory period. Okay, no new action potential will be generated. Okay, and then what? And then once and then eventually once the sodium gates close and the potassium gates open. Okay, that's the that's the relative refractory period. Okay, and that's when you see the big gallon spike in the electrical charge. All right. So, and then like I said, this happens all along the length of the axon. Okay, and this is the beauty of myelin. Okay, this is where myelin comes into play here because you know myelin makes you know allows neurons to send action potentials a lot more quickly. And here's why. Okay, you know remember. Myelin is a lipoprotein, right? In the, in the central nervous system, it's oligodendrocytes that produce and maintain myelin. In the peripheral nervous system, it's Schwann cells. Okay, but basically, and remember, these spaces in between the, um, the myelin sheets are called the nodes of Ranvier. Okay, now remember, these nodes of Ranvier, okay, when we're, when we're talking about depolarizing an axon or propagating an action potential, only the nodes of Ron VA have to be depolarized, okay? If you have a bare axon with no myelin, you have to depolarize every last little bit of surface area of that axon. It's going to take a lot longer, okay? So what's going to happen with a myelinated axon is that, so this axon hillock is going to fire, okay? Sodium gates are going to open, sodium in, potassium out, all this stuff, okay? And then what's going to happen is that current is going to be insulated by the myelin. Okay, so instead of having to depolarize every last little bit of surface area, okay, that current is going to be able to travel, basically think of it as underneath the myelin, through the length of the myelin on the axon. So then once that current reaches this next bare area, the node of Ron VA, that's going to stimulate the sodium gates to open, potassium gates to open and close, and you have another depolarization. And then the current travels under here. So basically that allows for the current to travel more quickly down the or to propagate more quickly down the down the axon. Okay, so as a result, myelin makes um, can increases conduction velocity, is what you would say. All right, and this is there, there's a word for this. It's called salta saltatory conduction. Okay, it's called saltatory conduction because if you if you look at this, it's going to look like the action potential is actually jumping from node to node to node. Versus like a bare axon, it's going to seem like it's it's like a current traveling down the length of a wire. Okay, I mean, like I said, this isn't like an electrical current traveling down a, down a copper wire, but you kind of get the picture as to how this works. Okay, so that's the beauty of myelin. Is it is it, I mean, it can make a, an axon send a potential be thousands of times faster than um, than an unmyelinated axon. All right, so. Um, so that's saltatory conduction. And also another big factor that, that plays into this is the, the diameter of the axon. The bigger the axon, the faster, you know, the, the, the faster the conduction velocity as well. Okay, so keep that in mind. Big myelinated axons send action potentials at very rapid rates, like, you know, big motor nerves, you know, motor neurons going out to skeletal muscle. Okay. Um, so... That's the action potential in a nutshell. All it really is is just an influx and an efflux of potassium, and then we reset the membrane potential via the uh, via the sodium potassium pumps. Okay, and if there's nothing to really irritate this this neuron, you know, up to and beyond this threshold, it's not going to generate an action potential. All right. Now, uh, now again, we said the whole the whole main purpose of this is 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 for the purpose of releasing neurotransmitters. We said that this that the main the neurons mainly communicate via these chemical synapses. Okay, so we've got okay we've got this axon. Okay, we generated an electrical impulse down the length of the axon, and eventually it's going to hit these synaptic terminals. Okay, these synaptic terminals. Now, what's going to happen once we reach these synaptic terminals? Um, you know, that's going to stimulate the release of neurotransmitter. So basically, if we kind of look at one of these, um, if we take a look at this up close a little more, okay, what you see is you're going to see this vesicle-like structure, then you're going to see some kind of target tissue on the other side where there are receptors for this chemical message. 
All right. Now, inside of this synaptic terminal, often called a bouton, is French for button. Okay. Inside of here, there are vesicles that store, neural, store, like I said, neurotransmitters. Now, what happens once that action potential propagates its way down to the synaptic terminal? You're going to there's going to be there are, there are calcium sensitive gates that are going to open. Okay. And these calcium channels. Okay. So calcium is going to there's really no calcium inside the cell whatsoever. Okay, so so once the once the calcium gates open, calcium will diffuse inward. Okay, and then that influx of calcium will basically stimulate the synaptic vesicles to fuse with the cell membrane. Okay, they're going to fuse with the cell membrane, and then via exocytosis, you're going to dump out neurotransmitter. Okay, and then the neurotransmitter is going to diffuse downward because there's no neurotransmitter on the target tissue. Okay, so then neurotransmitter will diffuse down this space, which is what we call the synaptic cleft. Okay, the synaptic cleft. All right, and so so bear in mind that when a nerve communicates with a tissue, it does not physically touch the target tissue. It's very close. Okay, but it doesn't physically touch it. Okay, there has to be room for diffusion to take place. There has to be room for these neurotransmitters to bind to their receptors and to create the conformational changes that we need so the receptors can stimulate the cell to do what it does, okay, to either increase or decrease activity, all right? So then these neurotransmitters are going to bind to their respective receptors, and like, for example, let's say this is a motor neuron, okay, and let's say this is a skeletal muscle. Okay, and the neurotransmitter in this situation would be acetylcholine. Okay, so acetylcholine is going to diffuse down the synaptic cleft. It's going to bind to its specific receptors, and then that's going to stimulate basically sodium gates to open, and the, basically the uh, the muscle is going to become depolarized. Okay, so then as a result, then and then that's the beginning of a muscle contraction. There's a lot more to that. Okay, but you know again that's that's basically the big reason why we generate these action potentials, is to stimulate the release of the specific chemical message, these neurotransmitters, so they can bind to their target tissue and do what they do. You know, if it's with another neuron, they're going to either you know, make it easier for that neuron to depolarize, um, and, you know, it's going to increase you know, the, you know, the excitatory uh, postsynaptic potential here, or it's going to make it harder, you know, what we call an IPSP inhibitory postsynaptic potential here. So so it may so there may be a, a neurotransmitter that makes, you know, CL gates open and more and more chlorine comes in and the inside becomes more negative. So that's going to make it harder for the cell to fire. You know, that may stimulate the opening of sodium gates if it's the right kind of neurotransmitter. And that's going to start to depolar or make it easier for the cell to depolarize. That's how neurons communicate that's the primary mode of communication with neurons. Okay, in this situation with the muscle Acetylcholine got, you know, was the, you know, acetylcholine release was the beginning of the, you know, the muscle contraction. Okay, and then when all is said and done, okay, when this nerve stops generating action potentials, then, you know, enzymes are going to separate the, um, the neurotransmitter from the receptors, and then basically the synaptic, you know, the bouton or the synaptic terminal is going to take up the excess neurotransmitters or the parts of the neurotransmitters. Then it's going to resynthesize them and restore them back in the vesicles to, you know, where they're going to wait again for another, you know, for another action potential to be released. Okay. And like I said, in a nutshell, that's realistically what an action potential is. Okay. It's just an, uh, it's just an electrochemical impulse travel, that travels down the length of the axon that will eventually stimulate the release of neurotransmitter. Okay. And again, that neurotransmitter, depending on the transmitter, depending on the tissue, depending on where the nerve is in the body, will elicit some kind of effect on its target tissue. Like I said, inhibition or excitation, realistically, if you want to think about that. Okay, so again, when it comes to the action potential, I can't, I know I've said this a few times, I can't say it enough. Okay, you have to remember, you know, understand resting membrane potential. If you really get a good grasp on resting membrane potential, then this is going to be easy because all this is about is moving sodium in, potassium out, and then resetting that membrane potential after all said and done. Okay, because once we reset this memory potential back to the resting state, back to negative 70 millivolts, then we're good to go. We can generate another action potential. Okay.
And that's basically, like I said, the main form of how nerves uh, communicate with one another. And like I said, think about this in terms of electrolyte imbalances as well and why these electrically, these excitable tissues 